Marcus Borg. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think you can tell also from my slides that I'm on parental leave at the moment. This is pretty much uh, <laughs> my company at the moment. Uh, but it's very good to be here. Um, I'm going to try to stay with the main theme of the conference today. I'm going to talk about beauty. I'm going to talk about beauty in uh, what some people refer to as software 2.0. And uh, yeah, we have some amazing international speakers here today. That's really cool to see this in Malmö. I represent the, uh, the local area, so I am myself deeply rooted here in Skåneland. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not originally from Malmö, but I've lived here for 10 years. So uh, if you ask me for directions to, to Mölland, uh, I know how to get there. And I will try to use this to give some, some local uh, examples now in my talk today. I'm going to talk about software 2.0, whatever that is. I'm also going to talk about beauty. I'm happy to introduce you to uh, Miss Sweden 1965, Ingrid Norman. And uh, Ingrid and I, we actually happen to share great great grandparents. So this is quite cool. This makes us third cousins, Brillinga for the Swedes in the audience. And I never expected my work in genealogy to give me a good introduction for a technical talk, but now I'm here, that's really cool. Uh, I'm also going to talk about machine learning. So here, represented by this uh, brilliant XKCD strip, with a guy standing on top of a pile of data, and just stirring until the results start to look all right. And I'm going to talk about Charles Darwin. And uh, since most of my research is in a safety-critical context, I will talk a bit about safety today as well. So, who am I standing here today talking to you? A uh, short introduction. I have a background as an ABB developer here in Malmö. I worked in process automation, uh, the site in Fusie. Uh, and I worked then with uh, compiler and uh, um, editor development mainly. But 10 years ago or so, uh, ABB, process automation in Sweden, substantially uh, downsized. So my work ended up in India, and I uh, returned to the university to pursue a PhD. So that is what I did. I did a PhD, a very applied uh, PhD, on using artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning techniques to automate various tasks in, in software engineering. So using software engineering data to make things easier and better for developers. Since 2015, I am a researcher with RISE. So you heard that before. It's a state-owned uh, research institute here in Sweden, uh, working to support innovation in Sweden and also to bridge the gap between academic research and industry practice. And that's kind of why I'm here today. Nowadays, I work more on uh, evolving software engineering practices to tackle the challenges when developing the AI-enabled systems. But I'm increasingly working on uh, using AI for software engineering of uh, AI-enabled systems. So I'm really uh, going meta here, as you hear. So, uh, what I plan to do when I return from my parental leave and I've got uh, funding for it, I will start working on uh, an AI meta testbed. So, it's going to be a testbed for testing AI testing. So, this is going to be really cool, uh, but that's for, for another talk. So, this is the structure of this talk. Uh, I have organized it in four parts. So we'll start by explaining what I mean by software 2.0. Then I will talk a bit about beauty from average to fair. And then I will talk about safety and rareness. And then finally I will uh, propose a solution to the problem and that's evolving the beast. Okay, so starting here with software 2.0. And the question I would like you to have in, in mind when I do this part is, will there still be beauty in code? Okay, first comes a quote. We have seen many quotes today. 
A large portion of real-world problems have the property that it is significantly easier to collect the data than to explicitly write the program. So this statement is from a blog post by Andre Kirpathy, director of AI at Tesla, published on Medium two and a half years ago, roughly. And what Andre is talking about in the blog post is that the first generation of software, we had source code, humans writing source code, and then other humans understand this source code. Perhaps even the same human sometime later understands this, this source code. Uh, with software 2.0, humans instead focus on curating data and specifying goals. And then you kind of leave it for backpropagation and stochastic gradient descent, whatever that is, uh, to fit millions and millions of weights in uh, neural networks. And those weights, they just show how information is propagated from one side to the other in the neural network. And uh, humans for sure cannot comprehend how the mapping from input to output happens. It's a very black box, this neural network. But this tends to work tremendously well if you have narrow problems, well-specified problems, and an abundance of data. So we've seen success stories and breakthroughs in, uh, in computer vision. I will talk about computer vision today. Voice data, like all the smart assistants, and uh, natural language processing, also written text, such as machine translation. Many uh, many new, uh, many benchmarks have been broken now in, in the last decade. Uh, and uh, looking at computer vision here as an example, suppose you want to train this classifier to recognize objects in images. This is kind of a, from a bird's eye perspective how you would approach that. You would start by collecting data. A lot of data. And this data, this raw data, you need to work with it manually. You need to annotate it, you need to say what is what in the pictures. And this is tedious work. This is cumbersome, this is costly, but this, it's what we need. It's what fuels supervised learning, and supervised learning is the type of machine learning that is happening nowadays. Mostly, I would say. Uh, and this is your training data, and this you feed to your network, and then you fit the parameter weights here, you train the network. And then when you have a new image, this image I actually took last winter. It's not far from here. Uh, it's close to the central station. You might recognize this ship. If you then send this image to the, this network, it will propagate through the network. And on the other side, you will have some predictions, depending on what you trained it for. This is an example of YOLO. It's an algorithm. You only look once algorithm. Uh, it does. Detection first, so an object, there is a bounding box, there is something interesting in the picture, and it also does recognition. In this case, it says it's, it's a boat, and there is a confidence level as well. So, I'm talking about AI here. Uh, it has been mentioned already today. And uh, AI is everywhere. Uh, everyone talks about AI. It's good to take a step back and realize that there is no consensus on what, on what AI actually means. This is, this is very good to remember. I like Wikipedia, both reading what it says there, learning from it, and contributing to it. If we check on English Wikipedia, it says that AI is intelligence demonstrated by machines. Okay, if we look at the uh, scientific literature, I like to go to the original source. This is the original definition of AI by John McCarthy in 1955. So it's a long time ago. This guy here coined the term and defined it as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. However, there is an obvious drawback here, and that is, OK, intelligent machine. Now we have to go and define that instead. Um, so that's a bit blocked backwards, but, okay, 1955. This is Malmö, 1955. So it's a very different place, obviously. Cars driving on the left-hand side and everything. Uh, 
so expectations back then on what an intelligent machine would be is, is of course very much different compared to what we would expect today. So AI is kind of a moving target. This is important to re remember. Uh, I think for me as a developer uh, that the pragmatic interpretation of AI is really, okay, what cannot be implemented using conventional source code? Kind of this, this helps me to uh, assess approaches I find and uh, think about whether or not it is AI-ish. Um, looking at the textbooks on AI, I think this is the one that is most commonly used at universities. It's by Russell and Norvig. It's a really thick book, a lot of content. Uh, in a book like that, and in similar books, you would find uh, a chapter on searching and optimization. You will find a chapter on planning. So this is typical finding the shortest path in graphs and what we now have as undergraduate computer science stuff. You will see reasoning, reasoning using logic and reasoning using probabilistic approaches. And then you will see learning. And learning, this is really what has exploded in the last decade. This is where all the momentum is. And uh, why did this happen now? We've had AI for such a long time, since the 50s, and uh, we've had two AI winters with limited funding and less progress. Uh, I mean, the first thing here is really what was also mentioned during the keynote, the availability of data. So all big data is not useful data, but it's a good start. We're talking about internet scale data today. Everything is connected, storage is cheap. And uh, then, at the same time, the, uh, the hardware has also um, evolved quite a bit. Now you can go and buy a gaming GPU, and thanks to the massive parallelism in those chipsets, you can do many of those AI things at home. Uh, yeah, not the, it doesn't scale all the way, perhaps, but you can do many cool things. And... Um, I think also it's quite interesting to, to note that many of the original IDs of AI when it comes to algorithms, they remain pretty much the same. So the IDs from the 50s and 60s, so we look at the uh, artificial neural networks, for example. I mean, these were inspired by the model of the brain we had back then. Quite simple model, we had this neuron connected to other neurons, activation functions, and uh, since then, of course, neuroscience has progressed immensely. I mean, the contemporary models of the brain, they are nowhere near as simple as this, this model, of course. But anyway, it's a little bit like the AI community took this 50s model of the brain and just ran away with it, uh, because this is still what is used to a large extent. But now it actually works really well. That is what has happened in the last decade. So with all this additional data that we now have available and the hardware. So researchers and practitioners in AI, they found out that by just adding more and more and more neurons, your models, your resulting models, got better and better. And this is, you know, stacking layer after layer. This is, of course, the, uh, the um, concept of deep learning. And uh, if you contrast this with other approaches to, uh, to machine learning, support vector machines, random forest classifiers, you might have heard about those. Uh, these other models didn't really scale that well with the data. They kind of flattened out, but it appeared that the neural networks, by making them bigger and bigger, things just got better and better. And that's what we've seen in many, many fields now. So the original definition of machine learning, I think, is good to be aware of, um, by an IBM researcher, Samuel, from 59, so it's also very old, computers' ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And this, I think, is really the essence of uh, Kirpathy's software 2.0. And this opens up for new application areas. So. Um, I wonder if the international speakers or the international delegates, I mean, do you know what this is? This is a consumer product here in Sweden. 
I see a few nods. Uh, not too many. Actually, the, uh, the company has its headquarters not far from Mölland, so this is really a local example. And I have the permission to show a video, so I will do that. So this is an airbag for cyclists, and according to all tests I've seen, uh, it's way safer than an ordinary helmet because it protects in different ways, rotational violence and things like that. And um, it's, it's a cool thing, you can buy it today. Uh, what I think is really fascinating here is that the algorithms, I mean, you have all those sensors here in this device, obviously, but the algorithms determining when it's time to inflate this airbag it hasn't been explicitly programmed based on sensor readings and uh, thresholds and stuff like that. No, it has instead been uh, approached in another way. So the clever developers instead recruited an army of stuntmen and stuntwomen and let them crash in many, many different ways. They collected all this data and they learned a model from it. They trained the system to understand the patterns of the sensor readings in accidents and they couldn't have done it without machine learning. So this is, I think, really, really cool. But the question then, um, the one I wanted you to think about, is there still beauty in code here if we do it like this? And what I want to tell you now is, yes, I can reassure you, there will be a lot of beauty in code still. Uh, you don't have to change your career plans uh, to work in software 2.0. This is a very good figure uh, published by Google researchers at one of the most prestigious AI conferences. It's called Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning. And what they argue there, based on experience from Google, is that, yes, the, uh, the machine learning code itself, it might be a small piece here. You have those, you define your neural network architecture, you call some library functions, not that much. But the rest, that's where the technical debt is. That is where the effort is, and that's where the costs are. So the, all the data collection, the data verification, and the infrastructure, shuffling data back and forth. There is so much code there running the show. So machine learning is really fueled by data, but still driven by code. And uh, there is a huge need for beautiful code also in the future. Good to remember. Okay, next part. So now it's more about beauty again. Um, is there such a concept as beauty in data? This is the, the question for this part. And uh, as I guess you know, since you're here attending this conference, the reason why this conference is called Beauty in Code it's because of a book chapter in uh, the book Your Code is Crime Scene by Adam Thornhill, local guy also. And uh, the discussion in that book chapter, based on uh, research and theories of physical attractiveness, uh, this is Ingrid again. Hi, Ingrid. Um, why is Ingrid beautiful? Turns out it's hard to say why. Beauty is a quality that is hard to pinpoint. And uh, research shows that attractiveness is, uh, is a negative concept. So it's rather the absence of imperfections. And um, this has to do with evolution then and staying away from scary genes and things like that. And it also shows that average is really beautiful. Um, this has been empirically proven by morphing together loads of faces and then you smoothen out everything and the end result is perceived as beautiful. And then Adam brings this concept to source code, um, argues that it's the absence of special cases that makes the code beautiful. Um, he adds that breaking expectations of the developer, it adds to the cognitive cost. And there is good empirical research supporting this uh, in, uh, in the field of program comprehension. If you have a mental model and you break the mental model, then you're in a good uh, position to introduce bugs. Um, so he kind of concludes here, Adam, by saying that beauty means no surprises. 
But what happens now if we have software 2.0? So here is software, first generation software, source code explicitly stating what is going on. All the logic is covered there, written by developers. Now you let go of some of the control. So now actually some of the inferential logic will instead reside in the training data. So what does that mean? Okay, uh, I like to uh, watch um, and consider software 2.0 as uh, interpolation on steroids. This is really what is happening. So a simple illustration here. Suppose you collect this height data, some landscape somewhere. Based on this, you can create an elevation map. Nothing strange. And then when you have a new observation, okay, uh, you want to predict, okay, what is the height here? Then you can easily uh, come up with a good guess here. So what you do here is you interpolate. And uh, in machine learning, we talk about generalizing from the training data to new observations. So we have training data, we generalize to a new observation. However, extrapolation, this is risky business. So suppose you now train your model based on data from this region, and you want to make a prediction over here then it's risky business. So uh, suppose you have this hovding, and you train the system on male stuntmen here in very flat Malmö. Would you then sell it to girls in Zimbabwe, a hilly city in Zimbabwe, perhaps? Uh, probably not, probably not. You should probably think about that. So it's quite obvious here that when it comes to beauty in data, average is no longer enough. Just having average training data will not get you far. You will only be able to predict the average. Uh, so it's the opposite here. We want to have diversity. So this is the essential concept in beauty and data. So you really need to capture the, uh, the, uh, the variation of the possible input space. You want to span the input space to avoid surprises. But another concept that is related to beauty is still very relevant. So symmetry is relevant. Symmetry is important in physical attractiveness, and it's important here as well, because unless you have symmetry in your data collection processes, you will introduce biases. And if you have humans as the data points, this might even be illegal, this might be discrimination. It might at the very least be very uh, unethical to do it like this. So there is good research on what is now called FAIR AI, uh, good research in Europe, uh, and one of the key uh, components there is to make sure you treat all the subgroups of the data, of the possible input space, in the same fair way. So, okay, is there such a thing as beauty in data? Yeah, I would like to share my view on this by comparing it side by side with beauty in code. So, beauty in code, it's about not surprising the developers. We have some to tools there for our uh, disposal to help this. We can have conventions, review processes, we can have static analysis tools, uh, but still we have to continuously uh, make sure that the technical debt doesn't just uh, move up. We need to consider all the time when and how to refactor our systems. Okay, nothing new there. Uh, so let's look at the, uh, the other side then, beauty in data. So I think beauty in data is about fair training data that is not surprised by input. And again, we have some tools to help us here. One very important thing is to bring in domain experts that actually understand the possible input space. Then we have legal compliance. It's not only about GDPR, I think there will be more uh, regulations in this area. Uh, and that will hopefully help us a bit. We can also use statistical analysis to make sure that we have a good balance in the training data. But still, we have to continuously monitor for something. And in this case, what is really important is to monitor for trends in the input. So this is called distributional shifts in machine learning. So you train for something and then the environment changes and everything changes all the time, so this is not strange. The question is when and how to retrain the systems and what data should we use to retrain it? This is a hard question, actually. Okay. 
beauty, beauty, beauty. Um, what about this guy? Where is the beast? And to discuss the beast here, I would like to bring in another application example here. Um, so this is now automotive software engineering. And this is a pedestrian detection system. So those systems are typically based on forward-facing cameras. And then you have some complementary sensors, radars maybe, LiDAR. Um, some companies have only cameras, but that's another story. Uh, when you deal with automotive software, I mean, a big part of that is uh, the regulations, the safety standards, ISO 26262, this rigorous body of processes. Uh, this permeates much of the development there. And this big piece, it has uh, parts on management and supporting processes, such as you should do configuration management. And then they, you have this core, more technical parts with you know requirements engineering, architecture and design. This is how you should do verification and validation. What I think is interesting here is that many of those activities are really supporting uh, beauty concepts. So you, are, you have to have review processes. Any, checklists, conventions, things like that. Things that help us uh, make the code more beautiful. Um, but it's not enough in software 2.0, that's, that's for sure. Uh, there is an interesting definition here also in the standard, and that is the definition of functional safety. So safety here is defined as the absence of unreasonable risk due to hazards resulting from malfunctions. So we are talking about bugs, more or less. And uh, interesting to, uh, to note here as well, we again have a negative concept here. So beauty was uh, absence of imperfections. Now we have absence of unreasonable risk. So there are some similarities here. OK, but what happens now if we have this image? We have this boat. We send it to the neural network. And the output is nothing. There is nothing there, the network says. This is not a typical bug. This is not a developer who uh, introduced some, some bug in the code. Uh, it's nothing like that. The neural network, it was trained to do this. It did its thing. It just wasn't good enough. And this is a big problem and a big headache in, uh, in the automotive software uh, uh, domain at the moment, and in other domains as well, of course. Uh, so the way ISO has tried to tackle it, it is by developing a brand new safety standard to complement the old one, to also uh, cover this uh, AI machine learning based systems. And what they uh, have decided to introduce as a key concept there is, I think this is a good term to remember, functional insufficiencies. So it's not a bug, it's just a system that does its thing, it's just not good enough. But this might, of course, be dangerous still. Do you remember this, um, this crash? It's already four years ago. Uh, this was a statement by the Tesla team one month after this uh, accident that generated a lot of headlines. So it says that uh, neither the autopilot nor the driver noticed the white side of the tractor trailer against the brightly lit sky. So you had this, there was no contrast in the picture. Um, it was a fatal crash. The driver of the Tesla died here, passed underneath the, the tractor trailer. Uh, and then there is more text and then extremely rare circumstances. You often see that in crash reports, in incident reports. Uh, the problem with the extremely rare circumstances is that there are so many of them, of course, if you travel on public roads. Uh, I like this collection of uh, corner cases by uh, Dr. Philip Koopman under the hashtag, did you think of this? So we have the bus in a sinkhole, guys carrying a trampoline on a street, holograms used for speed reduction. And my favorite here, the mounted police with the tail mounted LED lights to control traffic. Um, yeah, you can find anything out there. And really, uh, where, where is the beast? It is kind of obvious from this example that, well, average, again, average is not easy. 
sorry, average is easy. Average, being, av being safe in the average case, it doesn't bring you all the way, though. It doesn't matter too much because the rare cases, these examples are, 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 are hazardous. So this, uh, I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, Google released, it got viral, uh, a, a video from their self-driving cars there. They detected this lady in a wheelchair chasing this duck with a broom. It's very funny. Um, but, you know, it passed the, the street and uh, crossed the street and, uh, yeah. A very interesting data point there. So, okay. Despite having beauty in data, the problem is that the beast might very well hide in the cracks. Okay, in the final part here, I will show an example of how we can try to flush out the beast to find the beast in the cracks. And this is by using a concept or an approach I like to call beauty and test to stay with the theme. Uh, so if you are uh, a developer in automotive software, of course you want to try your things in real cars, but, well, that's slow, it's not really part of your continuous integration process, it's very costly, it might be very ineffective as well, because you rarely get a, come across those ladies in wheelchairs. Uh, and if you provoke those situations on closed test tracks, it might be dangerous, dangerous for, um, for the driver, or if you remote control the car, it might be dangerous for the equipment, costly equipment. So what you end up doing quite a bit is um, simulations. And this is a simulator I am working with at the moment, developed by a team in France, ESI ProCivic. And as you see here, the, the simulators are improving rapidly. They are getting better and better. And it's not only about those visual, what you can see here. I mean, it's just as much about how you simulate how the radar works in foggy conditions and things like that. And uh, they are, yeah, they're getting better and better. So, but using simulators, we can look for the beast in a much better way. So I will now talk about a very concrete example, simplified example a scenario or a scene, as, as they say in automotive uh, testing here. This is the scene. You have a car, you have a straight road, and you have a pedestrian crossing from the right. And uh, the system under test is then this pedestrian detection system. And um, we specify a test case here in this very simple scene by five parameters. So we have first the X and Y of the pedestrian. Then you have the orientation of the pedestrian, so kind of like the uh, angle of attack, how the pedestrian crosses the street. And then you have also a constant speed of the pedestrian and a constant speed of the car. So very simple, five parameters, this is your test vector. And then you also have some domain knowledge, you know how fast can a car go, kind of, and how fast can you run. Uh, there are some limitation constraints here, but still, the number of possible test cases here are still, they are endless. I mean, you can test anything, real numbers here. Um, so the question is, what, what should we test here? Where is the beast? And it's good to um, consider what you actually want to uh, test for here. What's the purpose of the testing? So what you want to do is you want to see where there are crashes. And where are the crashes? Well you have then a minimum distance between the car and the pedestrian. So if the distance between the car and the pedestrian is zero, then you have a crash. So this is what we're kind of optimizing for. Five parameters, not that many parameters, but still too many to visualize it easily. So we have a hyperspace here. So let's make it simple for us. Let's project it down to 2D plane. So now you have this input space with some constraints. Um, okay, what sh should we test? Different approaches available, of course. Um, one would be to sit down with uh, domain experts, reason, think about what to test, read specifications of the radar maybe, and try to come up with good test cases. This is probably a good idea, but it doesn't scale, obviously. Um, you could do the opposite, basically, do random testing, just bombard the simulator with different test inputs, see what happens. 
Random is powerful. Uh, this is probably also a good idea. But you can't only do random. It's very hard to argue in a safety case that this is sufficient. Um, what you could do also is using grid search. So this is an approach when you optimize physical processes with response surface methodology, for example. You systematically test things here in the landscape. And then you evaluate, and you see some the brighter pluses here. Those are more promising, smaller distances. And OK, this region appears to be good. Then you focus, put the finer grid there, finer, finer, and then you have an optimum. And this is one way. The big downside here is that this is very slow. You need a lot of test execution. And actually, even though it's in a simulator, it takes quite some time to simulate things because there are physical processes involved. And um, also, you shouldn't forget that the licenses to use those simulators are very, very expensive. Um, so we need something better. And now I'm going in Darwin then. I worked by Darwin on uh, um, kind of almost a forgotten part of AI, search and optimization, evolutionary computing, genetic algorithms. Uh, it's not trendy now, but it's still very useful. And I think it's very useful for testing the, uh, the very trendy AI. Uh, so I'm going to talk now about search-based testing. I didn't invent the, the concept, not at all. I'm a very applied researcher, so I just cherry-pick good research and apply it. Uh, so this is work I did uh, this fall with the University of Luxembourg uh, as part of the Testomot project. I will teach you quickly how you do it. Um, so you start with an initial population. So now we use biology-inspired terminology here for this, uh, this concept. Initial population, you randomize this. Random is powerful, you start with a random population. So we'll have eight individuals in our population here uh, to make it easy to, uh, to get an overview. Um, and we talk about biology, so I like to put them here on this Petri dish uh, and let the test cases be represented then by different colors and shapes. Uh, so this is our population. Uh, each individual, of course, is represented by the test vector. And we call this test vector the chromosome, and each value here in the chromosome is, is referred to as a gene. So this is the, the terminology here. And uh, now we have our first test cases. We know how to measure whether or not they were any good. We have the distances, so now we need to simulate it in the simulator. So now we plug in the different test vectors, see what comes out. So here you see the pedestrian coming from the right. And then you measure and you get some values. So this is the fitness function step. Now you continue with the selection process. Now you pick the most promising examples, the test cases that resulted in the minimum distance and uh, you select them, put them in this reading pool, and then you uh, uh, have some uh, random chance for, for those individuals to become parents. Uh, you mix and match a bit. Again, there is randomness in this process. It's very important, actually. Uh, and then you generate offspring by doing crossover, so combining genes of the parents into new test cases. Here you see them are green, and the shapes change a bit. And then you also have a step of random mutations. So sometimes you add a random mutation. This is very important as well. Uh, something here turned purple, something now has this yellow border. Uh, and then you do some survival of the fittest, which means you remove the least promising test cases and you introduce the new test cases. And then you run it in the simulator. You get results. Some are better, some are worse. Uh, second generation. And as you understand, you can do this again, select the most promising individuals, give them a chance to become parents, combine their genes in this crossover part, you have offspring, you mutate, you remove the least uh, uh, fit individuals and you introduce new ones. And this is the third generation. We can continue, of course. Um, we can stop when we find a crash. Where if we find the beast, that's good. Time might also run up. Uh, we might have a search budget. Um, there is randomness in it, so we might have to do it a few times. And um, this is what it looks like from, uh, uh, from above again then. We have the initial population, and then each generation, we see how our test cases looks a bit like they are exploring the area. That's 
uh, the whole point here of search-based work. So then it kind of zooms in on this area. And if we are lucky, this is then an example of a crack where we can find the beast. So evolving uh, the beast, that is um, my message here. And the whole approach is about using search-based testing to find those functional insufficiencies, as I so call them. And this is an example of beauty in, in test. And um, I want to show also in the simulator what it looks like. So this is now a Mini Cooper driving on this straight road, a pedestrian crossing from the right. Uh, you have the dash cam in that corner and the radar, you can see that. And then on this side here, the right-hand side, you see uh, output from the pedestrian detection system. There are some bounding boxes when there are detections, and there are uh, some edge detection there. And uh, the car actually does not break in this uh, example, so it's, uh, it's good to, to know that. But you see this repeated execution then. Um, it's uh, individuals from the same generation here now um, evaluating their values. And uh, yes. It turns out this is an efficient and effective way to find those corner cases in simulators. Okay, so I'll just wrap up then um, my main messages today. Software 2.0, it enables new applications. So one good example is this local company Hövding with the airbag for cyclists. Beauty in code it will remain fundamental in software 2.0 because machine learning approaches, yes, fueled by data, sure, but still driven by code. And we need good code, maintainable code there. Uh, beauty in data, yes, I think it exists. We need to change the mindset a bit. It's about fair and trusted training. Critical software 2.0. To deal with that, we have to tackle the rare beast, so it's not about the average case. And then uh, I showed an example of using AI to test AI here, so using beauty in test to evolve this beast. And uh, yeah, that's it really. So uh, most of the source code for this uh, search-based testing I showed, it's available on GitHub under an open source license. To actually run it in the simulators, you need to pay a lot to get the licenses. But uh, anyway, uh, the main concepts are there. Um, and uh, please get in touch with me if you're interested in this topic. I'll be here today and I'll remain in the area. And uh, thank you very much.